Edo Bay, July 8th, 1853. Four Western ships sail into the bay, headed for the capital of the Tokugawa shogunate. Ignoring warnings that this port is close to foreign ships, they anchor, turned their heavy guns toward a coastal trading town, and open fire. But they're blanks. Intended, they claim, to celebrate the 4th of July. But the intention of this fleet, and its leader, Commodore Matthew Perry, is not so benign. He has a letter from U.S. President Millard Fillmore requesting that Japan open its ports to trade. But Perry also sends his own letter along with the gift of a white flag. He says that if the shogunate refuses the request, it will lead to war. A war that Japan will certainly lose, and in such case, they should use the white flag to indicate surrender. The shogunate will accept Perry's terms, and in doing so, bring the era of the samurai to a bloody end. Eight months after Perry's arrival, and under the threat of military action, the Japanese government caved. The resulting treaty gave the U.S. trading rights in two Japanese ports, an American consulate in Japan, the right for American ships to purchase coal and ensured good treatment of shipwrecked American whalers. And in doing so, the Tokugawa shogunate abruptly ended a policy of isolation that had kept it sheltered from the outside world for 220 years. That period of isolation began shortly after the shogunate's founding in the Sengoku Jidai, or Warring States period, which you can learn about in our series on them, when the Tokugawa closed itself off to minimalize destabilizing factors. The first move was to avoid military campaigns abroad unless victory was absolutely assured, a policy inspired by shogun Toyotomi Hideyoshi's disastrous invasion of Korea. And clever diplomacy between the equally insular kingdoms of China and Korea ensured that the three powers would stay out of each other's way. Then second, they banned and brutally repressed Christianity, which Hideyoshi believed undermined the traditional structures of Confucian loyalty, and barred Spanish and Portuguese from entry in hopes of stopping Catholic missionaries. Dutch, Chinese, and for a time English ships were allowed to trade in a limited capacity using an offshore island, but Japan essentially sealed itself off. Few Japanese were allowed to travel outside for diplomatic missions, and those who did were not allowed back. Foreign books were banned. At first, this insular policy upheld the shogunate's stability. No major losses in overseas wars, no chance for the Tokugawa's rivals to make foreign allies, and no disruptive revolutionary ideas challenging the shogun's strict caste system. In fact, it created one of the most peaceful periods in Japanese history. But it also came at a cost. Without access to, or knowledge about, the outside world, technological development slowed to a crawl. Now, while that wasn't a problem in an era where Japan's rivals were China and Korea, the shock of Britain defeating China in the First Opium War showed that Japan was woefully unprepared to counter foreign invasion. Added to that, the shogunate's enforced caste system, where a family's rank was permanently fixed, came under strain. At the top of the pyramid were the emperor and court, whose power was only ceremonial. Then it was the military leader, the shogun, though technically ranking below the emperor, who actually ruled with his daimyo or lords, followed by the warriors of the samurai beneath. Next came the farmers and artisans, and at the very bottom was the merchants. But here was a problem. The samurai were a class defined by war. It was how they made their money, and their whole purpose was to obediently fight the shogun's enemies. And Japan had largely been at peace for two centuries, so you could start seeing the writing on the wall. In that time, most samurai ended up turning into bureaucrats and estate managers for their daimyo. They still kept warrior codes and trained in swordsmanship, but that was largely ceremonial. Others, let go when their lords cut their militaries, took to the roads as masterless samurai called ronin, some of which little better than bandits. And rendered unnecessary and impoverished by peace, the samurai class increasingly fell into debt. But you know who didn't? The merchants. Yeah, those lowly merchants at the bottom of the pyramid kept gaining financial power from even the limited foreign trade, essentially upending Tokugawa society. They became a new middle class, living increasingly urban and decadent lives in the cities, engaging in an entertainment and artistic culture called the floating world, which encompassed red light districts with theaters, brothels, tea houses, baths, and geishas, and new forms of art like kabuki, puppet theater, painting, live comedy, and political satire flourished within these districts. It was also a world where there was no recognition of rank. In these districts, a rich merchant got better service than a poor samurai. So even before Perry's arrival, the discontent was rife among the samurai, especially among the historical enemies of the Tokugawa in the south. 
So when the shogunate officials signed a treaty with Perry, it exposed the weakness. Anti-foreign daimyo rallied against the government for their shameful surrender, rather than fighting the Americans with honor. Yet as internal discontent reared its head, the shogunate was more concerned with external threats. After the signing, Perry had presented the shogunate with official gifts of rifles, Colt revolvers, a sample telegraph system, and a waist-high model locomotive, technologies that stunned the Japanese officials. If they were ever to stand up to these Western barbarians, they needed to modernize fast. The shogunate quickly entered negotiations to buy steamships, rifles, and modern cannons. Plus, they sent officials overseas to scout for new technologies. But they weren't the only ones arming up. Daimyo that opposed the treaty began purchasing weapons as well, preparing for conflict with the shogun. Discontent grew. Foreign trade crashed the currency and caused massive gold and silver outflow. Plus, three powerful earthquakes rocked the country within two years, one striking the shogun's capital of Edo, and another triggering a tsunami that hit one of the new American ports. Even the gods seemed disquieted. And in the next five years, even more Western treaties were foisted on Japan, with many of the negotiations overseen by Chief Minister I. Naosuke. Foreigners were now exempt from Japanese law, and Christianity would be tolerated. An opposition party coalesced, centered around the slogan, Revere the Emperor, Expel the Barbarians. It was a party that was particularly strong in the eastern province of Mito, and in the south among the longtime Tokugawa enemies of Setsuma and Shoshu. Increasingly, they began to talk about overthrowing the shogunate and replacing it with a government centered around the currently ceremonial emperor. Among the southern nobles were three men that would play a key role in events to come, becoming known as the Three Great Nobles, but we'll meet them later. The emperor was, after all, still technically the head of government, and he was privately furious about the unequal treaties. For the anti-foreign and pro-imperial parties, it was an opportunity to finally do away with the Tokugawa and rally behind the emperor instead. It was a particularly convenient time for a coup, since there was also a succession crisis in the shogunate. Because you see, during the negotiations with Perry, the shogun had died, leaving the position of shogun to his sickly son, who only lived five years. Then when he in turn died, multiple factions tried to back their favorite candidate. One faction backed Tokugawa Yoshinobu, who would be key to later events, but Ienosuke managed to steer Tokugawa Iemoche to the position, despite the fact that he was only 12 and the other candidates were adults. Inayosuke became regent for the young shogun, assuming most of the official powers, and he immediately used his new influence to purge court of opposing factions, putting Yoshinobu and his supporters under house arrest, banishing the anti-foreign party from court, and beheading their two most prominent leaders for plotting against the government. It was the start of what would be an increasing cycle of political violence. Edo Castle, March 24th, 1860. A festival day. Inayosuke is needed at the castle for meetings. His train of attendants, 60 guards and palakin bearers, are all on the lookout. There have been threats. Suddenly, there's a shot from a Colt revolver. Shouts. Sunlight on blades. A group of ronin from Mito crash into the front of the guards. The attendants drop East palakin and surge forward to protect their daimyo. They don't see the man coming from the side, approaching the now unguarded sedan chair. It's a samurai from Satsuma. He drags the minister out of the chair and decapitates him right there on the road. As the guards turn stunned, they see the samurai holding their master's head aloft in triumph. One guard cuts the assassin as he tries to flee, and then mortally wounded, the assassin falls on his sword rather than be captured. There is no going back. From here, the violence will only worsen, and the streets of Kyoto will flow red with blood. We see you, Ahmed Ziad, Turk, Alicia, Bramble, Casey, Mustia, Dominic, Valenciana, Gunnar, Clovis, Kyle, Murgatroyd, and Oriels1. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.